Good afternoon, everybody. You're all being so punctual and sitting down on time, so I feel like we should start on time. I'm Karen Von Hippel, the co-director here at, uh, of the Post-Conflict Reconstruction Project here at CSIS, along with Rick Barton. Um, on behalf of our office and Dr. John Hamry, the president of CSIS, I'd like to welcome you all here today um, to continue the discussion on Afghanistan. Um, it's been a kind of crazy few weeks in Washington for those of us who follow Afghanistan quite closely. Um, it's certainly a pleasure to welcome Mark Ward back here. He was here, I think, in June. Um, and he did such a fantastic job the first time that we have double the number of people who wanted to hear him the second time. So um, what we're going to yeah, do... But look who came. It's all your friends, I know. So, <laughs> um, But um, I think most of you do know Mark. Sorry, but... Most of you do know Mark. Um, he has been involved in the region for at least 15 years. He's been in Afghanistan a number of years now, working for USAID as well as the UN. I won't go into details because you have his bio in front of you, um, but what we'd like to do is he will speak for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll open the floor up for discussion and questions. We're filming, as you can see in the back, and it will be put on the CSIS um, site, so if you want to revisit it or send it to your friends, um, please just look on the, on the CSIS website tomorrow. So over to you, Mark. Thanks very much for joining us. My pleasure, Cameron. Thank you so much, and CSIS, um, for having me again. And I'm sorry you all were having such a boring Monday afternoon that you could think of nothing better to do. But um, So everybody's interested in Afghanistan. I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, if you came to hear the latest on the elections, get your money back. I'm going to try to stay as far away from that as possible. Um, I can tell you that my wife insisted when I arrived the day before yesterday that I get out and vote in the state of Virginia. Um, that's about all I'm going to say about elections. I've been on the job as the, whatever I am, special, special advisor on development um, for almost a year now. Um, as, as many of you know, this is a new position. Um, the Security Council asked UNAMA about a year and a half ago to take on donor coordination and the challenge of making aid to Afghanistan more effective. And so in the organizational chart for UNAMA, the UN Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, uh, they created some units to look after donor coordination and, and making aid more effective. And they brought me in um, from outside the UN family to, to lead that. Um, the, the head guy in, in Afghanistan, Kai Ayada, is an old friend, and, and so Kai turned to me to come, and so I've been on the job for about a year. And what I thought I'd talk to you about today, now having had a year to, to work on donor coordination and reflect on what works and what doesn't work, is just that, um, the challenge of donor coordination in Afghanistan. Um, I'm not going to be there forever. Maybe one of you will replace me. What I say today, may, you may change your mind. Um, in 2002, when everybody returned to Afghanistan, there was virtually no one to talk to in the government. A successfully coordinated donor program begins with a government in the lead a government that you can talk to, a government that can give you guidance, a government that can say no to a donor that has a bad idea. We didn't have that in 2002 in Afghanistan. So imagine that you represented one of the capitals around the world that wanted to provide aid to Afghanistan, and you arrived on day one, and you went to the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of whatever, and you found that there really was no one in charge and you send a cable back to your capital that says, well, now what do we do? There's nobody here to tell us what to do. Shall we just wait or shall we just start? And guess what the answer was from every single capital? Get on with it. And so the donor community got on with it. But what was it? It was everybody doing their own thing with no guidance from the government. Understandably, capitals were in a hurry to fix Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban. 
Fast forward six years later, 2008, and this everybody getting on with it, everybody doing their own thing, people not listening to the government has created a mess in terms of donor coordination. Two very important things happened in 2008. Number one, the Security Council, based on input from a whole lot of governments, said something's got to be done about this. Resources are being wasted, projects are duplicating, we're not following the government's lead in certain areas. Something, somebody's got to take control of this. So they, as I said earlier, changed the mandate, expanded the mandate of UNAMA to take on donor coordination. Something else happened in 2008. The government published, launched, for the first time, a national development strategy. The ANDS, which some of you, well, I hope you haven't read the whole thing. It's about 700 pages. What I've learned in one year, and I arrived, I guess you could also say, um, what, something else happened in 2008 is the UN started doing the donor coordination. I arrived in the fall. I started hiring staff. Well, it's been a year now, and time for reflection on what we've learned about donor coordination in Afghanistan. And I would say lesson number one, it's very hard to get donors to break habits that started six years ago, now seven years ago. The habits that the donors got into in 2002 when they arrived and decided that they had to get on with it before the government could provide much guidance have, for the most part, sadly, stuck. One other thing, an another thing that I've learned in this past year, and I think I knew this before, you don't change behavior by getting people to agree to change behavior. And what I mean by that is with all due respect to the organization I work for and other organizations around the world that try to get donors and, and member states to sign up to protocols and international agreements on behaving yourself, they really don't change behavior on the ground. So the conclusion that I have reached over this past year, which I sort of had when I arrived, because as Karen said, I've been in, involved in the region for a very long time, is that the way to really change behavior is to get involved in particular sectors and drive change. Not to start with some highfalutin protocol and hope that that would lead to change on the ground, because my view is that just hasn't worked in Afghanistan. But to focus instead on sectors where there is leadership, where there might have been someone at the table in 2002 if the donors had known where to look, who could have said, this is what you should do. And I would say, if you were to ask, so what are the ingredients for donor coordination in Afghanistan today? It's very simple. Number one, strong government leadership, but just as important and very, very hard, willing donors. Let me give you some examples. I, 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 don't, I didn't come to this conviction that this is the way to go based on some sort of dream or fantasy. This is based on my experience in the country over several years. There have been successful government programs launched in certain sectors. And the way they were launched and the way they were put together and the leadership that the government provided and the way the donors responded to that leadership is very instructive. And you know what they are if you follow Afghanistan. Public health. The Minister of Public Health sat down several years ago with the donors and said, I am sick and tired of all of you doing your own thing. I am sick and tired of visiting clinics in this country where I never know what I'm going to find, what kind of building it's going to be, what language the staff has been trained in, what sort of protocols they've been taught. I don't know what I'm going to find in the pharmacy because every country is doing their own thing. He said, that's going to stop. We are going to agree as a group what a clinic looks like, how it is staffed, what is in the pharmacy, and what kind of training its professionals get. And we're all going to agree to that, and we'll talk about it as long as it takes, 
and then we're all going to get behind that one approach. And that's exactly what happened. And all the donors contributing to public health, and there are many, follow the minister's blueprint. And it is not surprising to me that today, if you measure access to public health, which what, this is what the experts say, access means less than a two-hour walk, which for some Americans would be a very good idea. <laughs> less than a two-hour walk means, and, and you can get to a clinic, over 65% of the population now, now has access to basic public health. Education is another example. The Minister of Education a few years ago said, just like the Minister of Public Health, I have had it visiting schools. And some of them I arrive and I, I think I'm in Disneyland, and others I arrive and I'm afraid to lean on it because it might fall over. Every country is building their own way. Every NGO is building its own way. Some of them are asking, are there teachers? Some of them are not. People are importing textbooks. Others are using our textbooks. This has to stop. So we are going to sit together, donors, and we are going to agree on how you build a school, what's in it, and make sure that it is in the grid of my ministry so that I can supply teachers. Today, as many of you know, we have over 7 million kids in elementary school. During the Taliban time, our best estimate, it was well below a million. So it can be done when there is strong government leadership in a particular sector and it sits with the donors and it comes up with a plan, the donors will get behind it. We saw it particularly in those two sectors. We are beginning to see it this year in two more sectors, agriculture and private sector development. We have two terrific new ministers, Minister Rahimi in the Ministry of Agriculture, Minister Sharani, who was the Deputy Minister of Finance, is now the Minister of Commerce. And both of them understand the value of coming up with a strong program with the donors and then, with a little help from UNAMA, getting the donors behind it. And we have had some very successful um, initiatives launched this year. The donors were, were optimistic. The donors are beginning to move their money behind those initiatives. So soon we hope to be able to tell you, just like in public health and education, that this model has worked in two more sectors, that we'll be, able to be able to, we'll be able to talk about some real progress in agriculture, some real progress in private sector development, because we had ministers who were willing to take charge, and very importantly, ministers willing to say to donors who want to continue to do it their own way, stop it. And this is extremely hard, but this is a big part of my job, is to coach the ministers that it's okay to say no. If a donor is continuing to pursue its own agenda in the face of a very good idea from your ministry, just say no. And they're not yet convinced that the donor won't turn and go to some other country. I'm pretty convinced that they won't. We're talking about Afghanistan, not another country around the world. So. I'm seeing real progress. There was another very good example of the government leadership really um, coming through when I was here in June that we talked about here, and that's the government's new plan for technical advisors, um, which is continuing to get a lot of support and a lot of interest. The, the, hope, the, the, the plan there is that we stop importing so many advisors that look like me and a lot more advisors from the region who speak the language, don't need a bunch of security, don't have to go home every couple of months, and don't cost near as much, and have actually gotten something done in that part of the world. Now, I mentioned one of the other things that happened in 2008 was the launch of the Afghan National Development Strategy. And we all celebrated that at the time, and it was worth celebrating at the time. At the time, all of us were quietly, politely, I hope diplomatically, saying to Professor Nadri and others that were working on it, you know, you really need to focus this thing. Seventeen sectors and six cross-cutting themes is a bit much. Can't we focus it? Can't we prioritize it? Can't we phase it? Well, it didn't happen. 
we got the strategy out with all of its different sectors, and we celebrated that that was, that was an accomplishment in and of itself. And it was, absolutely it was. But the first year of implementation could have been better. And to its credit, um, Minister Zakhawal, the Minister of Finance, had a review a couple of months ago where he got all of us together, all of the donors and the UN, and we sat and we had a very candid conversation about what went right during the first year of implementing the ANDS, what went wrong during the first year. And there was pretty clear feedback from the donor community, UNAMA was in there as well, that you know, this really needs to be focused more in years two, three, and, and out. That resources were spread too thinly in the government, and I don't mean just dollars, I mean capable people, I mean energy and enthusiasm over too many sectors. And as a result, while you might have had a couple of inches progress across the board, what you needed is a meter or two of progress in a couple of sectors. Well, the government really took that on board, and I give it a lot of credit for listening that day and listening behind the scenes. And they have come up with a new plan for focusing their national development strategy that is, I think, bold and creative and really hits the mark. Basically, what the government has decided, and this is the current government. We don't know yet who the next government's going to be, but this plan which could turn out, if, if, if uh, Abdullah Abdullah wins, this could turn out just to be a recommendation to the next, to the next president. Um, but the plan basically says what we really need to focus on in the next few years is economic growth in this country. We need to start building the tax base in this country to sustain this incredible amount of help we've been getting from around the world. And we've got to start creating jobs. We've got to stop relying on our good friends from Pakistan and Turkey and India and the neighbor and Iran to take all of the well-paying jobs in this country. We've got to train our own professional class and skilled labor class. And so what they've done with that as the chapeau of economic growth, they've looked into the ANDS and they have identified three clusters of activities that support economic growth. And over each of those clusters, and I'll tell you what they are, for those of you that like to make lists, um, they, what, they've, what they've done in addition to focusing on economic growth and then three clusters under economic growth is they've come up with a new management structure. The government, again, I think is being very candid. And it said after the first year of implementing the ANDS, there were too many people in charge. Every ministry was a stovepipe. And it's one of the reasons why so little got done. So in this new plan, they are recognizing that and they are challenging the president to basically create three super ministers. Ministers who will take the lead in these clusters. They will have other jobs as well. They will be minister of a ministry, but they will be put in charge of a cluster and that cluster will include activities of several ministries in an effort to break down stovepipes and create initiatives across sectors, across ministries, to actually drive some change. This, is, this has never been done before. They are working right now on the terms of reference for those positions, those three positions. And they are, we are pushing, we are helping them push to make this a very binding obligation that's going to need the endorsement of the president. Um, as you can imagine, if, if you've just been asked, to lead a cluster of four other ministers, you're probably going to want something from your president saying you've got authority to ask those other ministers to come and listen to you. So this is new thinking. Now, what are the sectors? What are the clusters? The three clusters are, number one, recognizing that 70% of the population derives its livelihood, its income, its growth from agriculture. The first cluster is agriculture and rural development. And there will be one person over this cluster, and it will involve activities from the ministries of agriculture, rural development, the water part of energy and water, and counter-narcotics. So you get a sense of what I mean by a cluster. 
activities of those four ministries will be brought together in support of economic development under one person. Second cluster has to do with what I talked about before, skills development. We have what I would call a demographic time bomb ticking right now in Afghanistan. And ladies and gentlemen, it is one largely of our making. I mentioned how pleased we are that we have over 7 million kids in primary school. That's also a big problem because very soon in the coming years, we're going to have close to a million kids leaving class 12. Where are they going to go? We weren't thinking about this. Well, we figured it out. Better late than never. So this second cluster of activities is very much designed around how do we massively and quickly, with, you know, as quickly as we can, increase the number of places in higher education? How do we massively, and again with quality in mind, increase the vocational training opportunities in the country? How do we start teaching young Afghans the skills we need to maintain all the infrastructure that we've brought them? And, and lots of questions around that. This has to be a massive effort, but you're not going to grow the economy and sustain that growth if you have to continue to rely on imported labor for the skilled skills. And then finally, and this is, this is the most controversial, particularly with the United States, infrastructure and economic development. And what I mean by that is we believe and the government believes, who cares what we believe, the government believes that it's time to start exploiting the natural resources of the country to create revenue and jobs. Afghanistan has tremendous reserves of iron ore and certain minerals, copper. It also has, we think, natural gas. We know it has agriculture potential for the rest of South Asia. It's time to start investing in the infrastructure to exploit those resources. And the reason that's controversial with the United States is that most of those natural resources are not where the fight is. They are in parts of the country that are still relatively stable, in the center, in the north, where we think you could embark on a major infrastructure project and not have to spend half your budget on security. But as you know, the, the U.S. strategy is to focus a lot on the south and the east. And while you can make an argument that agriculture in Kandahar and Helmand is important and is a driver for the country in the future, and we accept that, um, it doesn't have the, the potential of the iron ore, the copper, the gas in the north and the center of the country. So the third cluster of activities is to make some massive investments in infrastructure in roads, in railroads, in crossing points, in laws to allow Afghanistan to start taking advantage of the natural resources and minerals that it has to, to, to create tax revenues, to create jobs for the future. And, and that will involve cooperation between, oh, I think I forgot to tell you which ministries are involved in the, in the last one. Let me step back and finish up on the the, the skills one. That will involve the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Higher Education, uh, Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs, and the Ministry of Women's Affairs. All of them have a piece of that cluster. And then the last one, the Infrastructure and Economic Development one, this is the biggest of them. I think it involves five ministries. Let's see if I can remember. Commerce, um, transportation, public works, mines, and then the energy part of energy and water. Because clearly, in order to exploit those resources, we're going to need more energy coming into the country from the northern neighbors. Some of that has begun already, but more needs to be done. So again, it's not just the clustering I'm talking about, which is bold, but it's a new management structure over that to ensure that stovepipes are broken down, people are put in charge who can get other ministers to cooperate for the first time. I don't know if I shared this anecdote when I was here in June. Um, I have to be careful. Karen's going to not invite me back if I start repeating myself. Um, but that's what old men do. Um, the old men are laughing. Um, 
Kai Ayada and I hosted a meeting at, at Kai's residence, I don't know, a couple of months ago, and we brought together um, to talk about this demographic time bomb that I mentioned, all these kids leaving elementary school and nowhere to go. And so we invited to the meeting the Minister of Education, the Minister of Higher Education, the Minister of Labor and Social Affairs, all of whom have a piece of higher education and vocational education. And they sat down and we brought out the coffee and you know we greeted each other and we got the small talk out of the way. And the Minister of Education, Farouk Wardak, said, Ambassador Ayada, this is an historic meeting. He said, why? We've never met before, the three of us. It took UNAMA to bring, first of all, figure out there was a problem, and number two, bring us together. So that gives you an idea of these stovepipes that you've got to deal with. All right, let, let me sort of tell you what's coming on this then. Um, this approach, this focused approach that, that, that UNAMA very much supports um, has to be accepted by the new government. I mean, it's not going to go anywhere, obviously, if it isn't. And so we are um, anxious to talk to the new government um, about it and, and hope that the new government endorses it. Um, in the event that this government becomes the new government, it, it is working on this already. Um, there are discussions in the cabinet right now about the terms of reference for these, you know, super ministers um, so that they can get on with their work now and not wait um, until the new government uh, is clear. And I must say, having met with the ministers that are likely to be in charge if this government stays uh, last week, they love this because it gives them something positive to focus on. And they, 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 were, they were just delighted to have something forward-leaning to think about. Um, and their enthusiasm was, was um, quite infectious for me as well, because all of us have been a little bit twiddling our thumbs out there recently with the uncertainty about the elections. This has given, at least on the economic side, those of us that work on those issues, something to really focus on, and that's been very welcome. It's also important to start talking to the donors about it, and that's why I'm here this week. It, don't tell Karen I said this, but it wasn't to talk to you. That was second on my list. Um, but first on my list was, to, was to, be, to be frank, to start selling this initiative to the United States. Uh, the United States is by far the biggest donor for Afghanistan, um, and we very much hope it um, can get behind this initiative in, in whole or in part. Um, and so this is the time of year, I know this from my old job, when you start coming up with your justification for the next year's fiscal year budget. And so the, the timing is pretty good to start to socialize this within the United States government. And we will be doing the same with the other major capitals around the world. Um, what we don't want to do is wait until everything is settled out on the new government, everything is settled out on this initiative with fully costed with budgets and all the rest, because if we wait that long, we will have missed another budget year. So we think it's very important to get this into the mix now, as tentative as it is, as uncertain as it is about who the government's going to be, it's important to get the people at state, at USAID, in the appropriations committees, and at OMB to start thinking about this. So this is something UNAMA is taking on um, to try, with the government of Afghanistan um, to try to get this into their thinking early. Um, the, the clusters that I mentioned are already starting to meet informally to identify initiatives to drive this economic growth agenda. Um, this is what I meant by they're, they, they're excited because they've got something to work on, something positive, something thinking about the future, not worrying about their jobs. Um, and the, the hope is, just in terms of process, for those of you that really follow Afghanistan and know how we get things done out there, is that this will become um, these, these initiatives will become more and more fleshed out. For each initiative, there will be a project paper with a budget attached to it. It will be very clear who's in charge. And that at the next JCMB, Joint Coordination and Monitoring Board, which is how the international community and the government of Afghanistan make decisions together, that this will be endorsed as a new initiative of the new government at the next JCMB, which will be sometime in the fall. Um, assuming we have a government by then. Um, so I'm going to stop there.
I guess what I what I really uh, had hoped to do, and you know, thank you, Larry Sampler, for coming. Um, better late than never, I guess. Um, I guess we'll see how good his questions are. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to give you a sense that um, all work, all thought about the future, has not ground to a halt in Kabul. Um, we are, at least on the economic side, uh, moving ahead on this this initiative. Um, it's keeping a lot of people busy, and that's very good because they um, have time to be busy right now um, because there's not a whole lot else going on. And I think it shows that there is still leadership out there that is focused on the future and focused on the real future, the future when they're not relying so much on us, but they're relying on their own resources to pay the bills and keep things going. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mark. That was a really rich discussion, and it's refreshing to move beyond the focus on troop numbers to get into the details of probably the most important component, the build component of this whole larger um, program out in Afghanistan. Um, it would be great to also know that those numbers for uh, donors, spent, donor spending outside the federal government budget, it used to be 70 percent of donor spending was outside the Afghan budget. It would be nice to see if that number could be reduced significantly. Um, before I open the floor, maybe could you just tell us a little bit about um, the negotiations between uh, UNAMA and other donors, the Afghan government and ISAF, to see how ISAF uh, or even McChrystal's recent assessment fits into this, especially if most of the effort is going on in the south and the east. It would be good to know how that is going to be pulled into the larger picture. We have a lot of moving parts and they all need to be coordinated. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't want to overstate. This is this is brand new, and I hope that the next time I'm here, I can tell you that we were, you know, fabulously successful, and were able to um, convince the United States and other donor nations to contribute um, significant resources to this. Um, too soon to say how successful we will be. The good news is that the, the 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 government, the executive branch, and the Congress are very willing to talk about it. Um, maybe they're just being polite. I don't know, um, but uh, we are we are getting a good hearing on this. Um, General McC General McChrystal's views about it, I don't know yet, but I will tell you that having read um, the unclassified version of his assessment on the way over here, um, I was pleased from an aid effectiveness point of view with some of the things I read. That's my other hat. I do donor coordination and I do aid effectiveness. It's all kind of the same thing, but I get two paychecks if I do two things, so I, I'm happy with that arrangement. Um, neither one of them is very big. Um, but what I, what I really like in uh, what, I, what I read in General McChrystal's report and what I really like in your new ambassador in Kabul's statements is the focus on Afghanizing. Afghanizing our assistance, Afghanizing our our security efforts. And that very much fits with this initiative. As I said at the end, this initiative is about thinking to the future when the Afghans are in charge, thinking to the future when the Afghans are paying the bills and young Afghans are performing the skills, are performing the tasks. When General McChrystal writes about um, using more Afghan firms to get the work done, connecting more with the Afghan people, rethinking security, rethinking force protection, getting out so we know what's going on. It seems to me I wrote about that once. Um, uh, th this is very welcome um, to UNAMA. And, uh, you know, we, we, we hope that those, that sort of thinking and new approach to the way we work both on the security side and on the development side can catch on. Um, I continue to believe that, yes, while security in the country is still a huge challenge, you know, two weeks ago we lost six Italians in, in, in one attack. I mean, it was just terrible. I mean, we were all in tears. Um, I mean, I could tell you personal stories about those six guys that you would, would have you weeping. Um, but notwithstanding, you know, if we are going to connect with the Afghan people, if we're going to find out what's on their minds and when we are making mistakes, which we are making every day so that we can adjust to them, we have got to get out more. We've got to leave some of our, our armor behind. Um, and take some more risks and get out and connect with the people. And I think then we're going to see, yeah, there, there, we will take some losses. There's no question about that. Um, but I think we will also see more effective use of our money, 
um, and we will design better projects because we will be talking to the people at the local level and hearing what it is they want. What we have to be careful about, and I think General McChrystal gets this as well, is that we stop substituting our judgment for what the Afghans want and start talking to the Afghans. And this is an area where I think we still have a ways to go, particularly with ISAF. There is still a tendency in the PRTs to get something done fast during your particular tour of duty, which I completely understand. Everybody likes to cut a ribbon during their tour. We have to stop doing that. We have to stop doing that in most parts of the country. In certain parts of the country where you don't have Afghan institutions there yet who can do those quick impact projects instead of you, I can't quibble with it. But in most of the country, in the West, in the North, in the center, where Afghan institutions are there now, and I don't just mean the National Solidarity Program, I mean other programs as well, that can start delivering services to the people that the PRTs used to have the monopoly on, it's time for the PRTs to stop doing it. But they're not. And they're continuing to focus a lot on quips, quick impact projects, when what they should be doing, particularly now that they're getting hundreds of millions of dollars a year, is take on some tough projects, like infrastructure. Okay, well, well let's take three questions at a time. I'm going to start out. And you also take notes, okay? <laughs> I'm going to start with Leonard over there. I'll take three from this area, and then I'll move to the middle, and then over there. Please uh, thank, introduce yourself. It's Leonard Doyle from the Telegraph newspaper in the UK. Thanks for a terrific overview. Just two things. I mean, we're obviously at a crossroads, and I hate to bring you right back to the security issue that Karen immediately mentioned, but we are clearly at a crossroads where we could be seeing a huge ramping up of military resources or the opposite. It seems fair to say that you're in favor of... of somewhat of a bigger footprint of security resources. Is that unfair? And then secondly, um, how do you deal with the issue of corruption? You didn't seem to address it, but you can hardly hear a conversation on cable news here without hearing the word corruption in the second sentence. So how does that fit into your plans? Thanks. Okay, thanks, Anna. Can you just pass it to the gentleman in the second row, please? The next question. Hi, uh, Steve Donnelly. I was uh, Senior Planning Advisor, Reconstruction in Iraq in 2007-8 and served on the UN DIBS team as their uh, expert planner and demographer. And it sounds like you just read through the entire litany of what our rear guard efforts were in Iraq to try and pull the U.S. Uh, efforts to some kind of an effectiveness. And I guess my, my core question is, as you sit here today, you, you understand what the problem is and you understand what you want to accomplish. What particular things do you need to see or engage from the U.S. government to get either the government or the public to understand exactly how to tackle the problems uh, you're laying out? Okay, can you hand it to the lady behind you, please? Thank you. I'm Aira Mukhtarzada with IFES. I'm just following up on the first question about corruption and specifically with economic growth. Don't you need to also focus on the judiciary sector and rule of law? Because um, obviously that leads into economic growth as well as a whole lot of other things. Oh, I'm supposed to answer these? Yeah. Yeah, they're, 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 they're very good questions, but I hope um, you won't be offended if I tell you I've heard them before, because um, there are – everybody's asking the same questions. Um, the security footprint and, and, and what do I think? Um, I mean, I guess trying to stay focused on the topic for today, um, my hope is that if we are successful in lining up resources to take on significant infrastructure projects in the center and the north, that we have the security we need to secure those projects. That will probably need, mean some flexibility in the deployment of security assets, um, whether they're ANSF, whether they're interna international, whether they're a combination of the two, you know, is, is you know, not worth discussing at this early stage. But clearly we will need some protection, um, which, you know, arguably would pull that those assets away from other parts of the country. Um, but I'm not going to get into whether UNAMA is for or against um, addi additional troop levels for the country. Um, 
not today. Um, corruption. Yeah, this always comes up. You know, why, why in the government's plan don't we have a cluster on corruption? And, and I love the question because it, gives me, it also gives me another opportunity to share some good news. We haven't had a scandal in the economic ministries. The United States of America, I don't know if you've ever dealt with the government of the United States of America. Do any of you pay taxes? You've, you've probably dealt with them. Okay. You know how cautious how constipated, how difficult it is for them to take any chances with their money. And yet, the government of the United States is providing resources directly to certain ministries in Afghanistan. And what that tells you is that certain ministries in the government of Afghanistan have developed very strong financial controls to keep track of U.S. taxpayer money, which is the hardest standard to meet. You, you probably haven't heard that before. So when, when you hear about contributions to the Afghan Reconstruction Trust Fund, the ARTF, which is managed by us and the World Bank and the government, that's a good program. That's a good fund. That's a good thing because it gets the government involved in managing money, and that money goes through the budget, so it becomes predictable, and they have a lot of say about how that money is spent. But it is not as good as direct support to the government. And what I'm, what, what's exciting is that these ministries that I'm talking about, working in this new initiative, they have received direct support from the international community, and they have accounted for the money. So yes, corruption is a problem, and I am very hopeful that by putting some resources in particular into human resources development, we will be able to strengthen um, systems to fight corruption, particularly in the civil service. Um, but, but the good news is that I can say with a straight face to a group of donors that you can responsibly make a contribution to this ministry if you choose to, or to the ARTF to support this ministry if you choose to. Because so far, I don't know if this is wood, um, we haven't had any problems with that. So there are corrupt free mechanisms in the country to receive donor funding that have worked pretty well. Now, the downside of it is <laughs> they're so worried about accounting for every dollar that they're slow as hell. Um, they, they're, 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 they're not great on the spending end. Um, they're good on the receiving and the reporting, but we've got to get them to spend a little faster. Um, but so anyway, that's that, that's a thought on, on corruption. Um, what does the U.S. government um, need to do differently? Well, I, I, I will try to stay in my lane and talk about what the U.S. government needs to do dif differently in terms of economic aid. I've already suggested one, which is pretty fundamental, and that's not focus so much on the South and the East. We understand completely, certainly I understand completely as an American, the importance of having lots of aid in provinces where our soldiers are fighting and dying almost every day. One of my best friends in Kabul, this is kind of hard to talk about, one of my best friends in Kabul is the DCM at the Italian Embassy. And as soon as I heard what happened on the airport road, I called him. And I expressed, you know, my sincere regrets and condolences. And he said, Mark, shut up. Your country faces this every single day. And how many of us call you? At least he got it. But still, it was a terrible loss. Um, what does the U.S. government um, need to do differently? It, it needs to spread its assistance around more. I always use one line. Some of you have heard it before. Um, a sliver of a big number is a big number in a part of the country that's not getting anything. We're not talking about massive shifting of resources. We're talking, the numbers from the U.S. are so big that a small shifting of resources could have huge impact in parts of the country that are saying, what do we have to do to get aid? Invite the Taliban? Invite the drugs? That's the line the Governor Bamiyan always used. So I would put that number one on the list. 
I could go on and on about changes that I think need to be made at, at USAID to become more flexible, less constipated, more able to react to changing circumstances on the ground. Um, I don't understand why, you know, the State Department, why, why there still is no administrator at USAID. I think it's most regrettable. I think some changes need to be made. Um, I work almost every day with the USAID team in Kabul, and I don't know how they do it. They work so hard, so long, they never take breaks. Um, you know, and after a while it begins to show. People get tired and worn down and, and uh, um, they need some help. And so I would say the number one change at USAID is get them some more help. Now, of course, they would say, where are we, where are we going to get them from? I used to make this argument when I was at USAID. The, the Foreign Service at USAID has never been smaller. We can't possibly fill all those positions in Kabul. I don't buy that. USAID is still sending lots and lots of very good officers to parts of the world that aren't quite of the same importance to this country as Afghanistan right now. So some strategic decisions could be made about sending the best they've got to the country that matters the most right now. And, and that's unfortunate. Um, so there's another specific change I think we could see. The question about other sectors, uh, justice sector reform, security sector reform, corruption, why aren't they in the government's plan? They're not in this government plan. I can confidently predict that if, if um, those who predict a new compact between the international community and, Afghan and the government of Afghanistan in the coming months, it will feature a number of new initiatives. This will be one. Um, this is the one I work on. I think we're the first out of the box, but I know that, that every one of the sectors you mentioned um, is also getting a lot of attention, um, but just to be parochial, not by me, um, and I'm your speaker today. Um, so uh, I hope that you will soon be hearing about new government initiatives to tackle some of these other problems. Um, one of them that, that, that captures the attention of my boss, of Kai Ayada, probably more, almost as much as anything else, um, police is always probably number one, but number two is the whole, the whole notion of institution building, um, capacity building, if you will, or even governance, if you will, particularly at the subnational level. It's an enormous problem, but it is not sexy. It is boring. It takes a long time. It is very hard to measure results. And one of the challenges that the government has in coming up with a plan for major investments in institution building is that it needs to find a strong champion and put somebody in charge. And it isn't the kind of, I mean, would you like to be known as the czar of institution building? I mean, it's a, it's a career killer, I think. It's very um, sexy. Yeah, I mean, I've turned it down many times. Um, maybe I should suggest that Karen do it. Um, it's just, it just doesn't grab anybody in the government to take that on, but it's desperately needed because here is an area, institution building, otherwise known as governance or capacity building. You can slice it so many different ways, but it touches every single sector, every single ministry in the government. Talk about stovepipes. Talk about inability to sort of get behind one effort and move out. It's been extremely hard, but it's desperately needed. And I am very hopeful that when President Karzai, if it's President Karzai, when President Abdullah, if it's President Abdullah, announces his new team, that there will be someone announced as that will take the lead on you know, an effort to build institutions for the country going forward. Okay, the middle group. Ambassador Smith, I think you had your hand up, Raja, and then. Okay. Um, so, Raja, right there, please. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Raja Gundu from the Hills Program on Governance. I had, some, I had a chance to work in development in Afghanistan for a bit. Uh, Based on my experience, uh, I thought, uh, you know, Kabul is actually uh, fast becoming, uh, because of uh, internal migration, it's becoming an island, uh, actually, of uh, growth, perhaps, as well as uh, it's rapidly becoming overpopulated. So what can be done uh, to uh, distribute the growth, uh, you know, across the country? Uh, secondly, uh, Afghanistan's markets are, you know, rapidly being, you know, swapped by uh, goods from, you know, by, by imports. And it makes sense at this point in time, perhaps, uh, when the domestic industry hasn't yet uh, uh, quite taken off. Uh, but what can be done in terms of, say, uh, some kind of trade protection 
to protect uh, Afghanistan's economy from uh, becoming uh, dependent on uh, neighboring countries' uh, economies or on uh, imports. Okay, and then the gentleman in the front row. Uh, hi, David Isby. Uh, you uh, obviously mentioned uh, Ministry of Public Health, Ministry of Education, often cited among uh, the two successes. They also have had the most direct impact in the 70 percent of Afghanistan where the majority of the people live. Uh, how can, what needs, if you're going to follow them, how can you again get other ministries to uh, have this impact outside of Kabul and provincial capitals? Great. Okay. Um, that's the middle group. Okay, let's shift over. Patricia, right behind you, please. Oh, yeah, you got it. Okay. Right there. Yeah. Uh, Patricia Fagan, Georgetown University. I want to thank you very much for this. You've, you've given us something positive to focus on, not just the, Af not just the <laughs> Afghans. But, and I want to draw you out on your next to last point, which had to do with institution building, capacity building. Uh, it seems obvious that capacity building is a major challenge in a country that has lost most of its most skilled individuals, professional, and in government. So on two levels, on capacity building in the government itself, I understand that there are some talented people in, in government at the highest levels, but I doubt that that goes all the way down through the, air, through the sectors, through the levels that it needs to go down. Moreover, public sector work being so desirable, there are bound to be political criteria in much of the hiring. So is this something that donors are willing to concentrate on or focus on, and if so, how? And the other related part of that is capacity building that you spoke of at some length for the Afghans themselves to have the professionals they need to be able to move forward. Well, where are the trainers of the train, the train, the trainers of trainers coming from? Um, at one point, the, anytime you went to a talk by any Afghan ambassador, that ambassador would plead with Afghan diaspora people to come out and help them and, and bring their capacities with them and so on. That's been um, not, I think, disappointing in general. But where, so where is it coming from? Okay, let's just take two more in the same area. Uh, the, the woman right here, please, in the purple and gray. Purple scarf. You, yeah, you, yeah, sorry. Yes, you, please, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Pamosha Hassan. I'm an uh, Afghan fellow with the U.S. Institute of Peace. I would like to thank you very much for uh, talking this afternoon, which was like more inspirational, talking about solutions. Since mm -hmm. I'm in Washington, D.C., we are talking about uh, problems with election. <laughs> Um, my question is regarding uh, higher education in Afghanistan. W wherever I'm going to talks, and um, there, uh, there is usually uh, issues raised uh, about capacity building and um, or uh, lack of capacity in Afghanistan, either in government and uh, um, or uh, maybe the institution that we are talking about. But I miss here about uh, real solutions towards uh, building that capacity. Uh, wherever I'm hearing is about short-term uh, projects uh, like vocational trainings, which is not uh, enough uh, to compensate for the, uh, the lack of professional that we need. And uh, I think uh, universities in Afghanistan in a dire need of uh, support. And I don't see uh, any donors talking about really working with universities who really can, uh, this is time taking, uh, but this, this, this is also sustainable for the organization that we are usually hearing in different uh, events. Great, thank you. Okay, the final question. Bill, did you have a question? Oh, no, the gentleman for me. Yeah, the, the gentleman over there in the blue shirt, right on the edge of the road. Thank you. And then this guy. And then, the then this yeah, guy. <laughs> uh, Zach Kearns with the Project on Middle East Democracy. Um, just a question, how, is, how have the democracy promotion efforts in Afghanistan affected development? Okay, and then final question on the, on the front row in this group. Thank you. I'm Chas Cadwell from the Urban Institute. Um, a couple of weeks ago, the administration sent to the Hill its own set of metrics for progress in Afghanistan and Pakistan um, that focused, as you might expect, largely on security issues. Do you have your own set of metrics for your program? And um, what are they? Hmm. I wrote them down, Mark, if you need help. So. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, a couple of questions around 
how do we spread the assistance um, out of the capital? Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't worry about that too much because I, I actually think, I mean, I remember back to my old job running the Asia Bureau at USAID. Um, when, you know, when, when John Wood and, and I and others used to sit around and, 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 and try to chart the new strategy, one of the things we usually started with was, you know, we're, we're, we're probably spending too much money in the capital. We do need to find ways of getting money, uh, spending more, developing more capacity, getting more done in the provinces. And that feeling remains. There are some donors, um, you'd have to get me drunk to tell you which ones, um, that continue to focus a lot on the capital because, after all, it is the home to an awful lot of people and a growing number of people, um, as you point out. But I think uh, the, the, the default these days is much more on what can we do at the subnational level. Um, and so I'm encouraged by that. Now that, you know, you may say, well, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Because a few minutes ago you talked about this new initiative coming out of the Capitol. Okay, the new initiative is coming out of the Capitol. That's where the ministers sit, but it is for, these are national programs we're talking about. These are national initiatives we're talking about. And, you know, we're not developing the iron ore deposits is not going to develop Kabul. Um, it might be planned in Kabul. Um, it might be to a certain extent overseen in Kabul. Um, but I, I, I guess I don't worry. I think Kabul gets enough, um, but I think the trend is very much in, in the opposite direction. Now, what to, oh, I have to sit up now. Andrew Nazio has <laughs> just walked in. Um, so t take back everything I said about Georgetown and USAID how many years ago? Um, all right, let me, let me move on. on uh, I, I love the question about um, – trade protection because it gives me an opportunity to plug one of my favorite initiatives, and that is local procurement. Um, you're probably not aware of this, but um, one of my pet projects in my job at UNAMA is a local procurement campaign. I am so sick and tired of all of the embassies, all of the international militaries, all of the aid agencies, all of the international NGOs. You go and visit their offices, and there isn't a damn thing from Afghanistan. Ladies and gentlemen, believe it or not, Afghans are capable of building chairs, tables, making lunch, providing tomatoes. But I eat tomatoes from, hell, I don't know where they're from. Well, they're, they, they ship them from Dubai. I don't know if they grow them there. They're not sandy enough. Um, and, and, and the worst offender of this is my organization. If you've heard this story, forgive me, take a nap. Um, there are two compounds next to each other in Kabul where I work. You've got Camp Eggers across the street. You've got Unama, and right next door you have UNDP. Unama has a cafeteria where every single thing, including the staff, is imported. Apparently, Afghans are incapable of making tea and coffee, apparently, according to this Italian company that has the contract to run our little cafeteria. I am not welcome in this cafeteria. They see me coming and they sort of close the door. They know I am on a public campaign to shut them down. Then you go next door to UNDP compound, where they have this wonderful Afghan restaurant where every single thing including the Coca-Cola, which they buy in Kabul, is Afghan. And you can get a cup of coffee and a cup of tea made by an Afghan. And frankly, the food is ten times better and much, much cheaper. So I say to the procurement officials at Unama, why? And you can just, you know, I get 17,000 excuses, and most of it has to do with, well, Mark, you know, we're concerned about your health. And I always point out to them, is this audience fairly adult, or are they? Yeah. No. Okay. Well, <laughs> what, what I was going to say, if you were adult, um, is, you know, when I eat in the Afghan restaurant, I don't spend the rest of the day in the washroom. I don't. It, it, they do fine. They do very well. And you see this 
in everything. Now, the United States actually leads on this one. The Congress legislated that the U.S. military, anything that it provides to the Afghan National Army, it has to source locally. And that has been a huge help. But our friendly allies have a long way to go on this. I travel to the PRT sometimes, and I always ask this question. You know, they always feed me lunch. And I go into the lunchroom, and I wash my hands, and I sit down, and they start bringing me the food. And I always say, oh, where did the food come from? And of course, they think I'm asking because I'm worried about the washroom syndrome. And so they say, oh, don't worry, sir. Everything's from Dubai. And I say, wrong answer. What's wrong with local potatoes? What's wrong with local tomatoes? Oh, we can't. We got this directive from Brussels and that directive from our capital and blah, blah, blah. So this is something we are trying to essentially embarrass people into changing. And the encouraging thing is we've got strong support from NATO HQ in Brussels. Um, we need to get General McChrystal's attention and General Rodriguez's attention on this for about 30 seconds so they can issue some orders. I think that will help a lot. But boy, this is an area where we, I mean, can you picture, those of you who have been there know what I'm talking about. Those of you that haven't been there, picture the size of the international community in Afghanistan today. It is never going to be bigger. We are never going to have the potential to leave behind a good economic footprint like we are today. And yet, we're continuing to import just about everything. I started out by talking about part of my job is breaking bad habits. Boy, here is a classic example. Um, so thank you for bringing it up. And you know, the next time you come to Afghanistan, please push for local tomatoes. Um, and look at your Coca-Cola and make sure you're drinking one you know, from the Coca-Cola bottling plant in Kabul. Um, Replicating the example, somebody was asking about, you know, how do we take the good, the success stories from the Ministry of Public Health, the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Reconstruction and Rural Development, how do we replicate those across the government? Um, good question. I wish it were simply something you could do with a wand or 20 bucks or something. Uh, what it takes is ministers that know how to lead, um, ministers that have a vision. First time I met with Asif Rahimi, He's the Minister of Agriculture. I'll never forget it. I mean, I would imagine it would be kind of like sitting down with Barack Obama. I'd like to think so. This man, in 30 seconds, articulated to me a vision to turn Afghanistan into, a export, into an agriculture exporting country in 10 years with details about how to do it. Now, with all due respect to his predecessor, who was a very nice man, he could not articulate that vision. He didn't know how to solve the problem. He had no idea how to solve the problem. And if he did, he kept it to himself. That's the key ingredient to replicating what was done in public health and education, is you need more Hanif Atmars. You need more Farooq Wardocks. You need more Minister Fatimis. I can never remember his first name, the Minister of Public Health. You need more Esan Zias. And when we talk to President Karzai about the future, I can tell you that we always remind him, we always pat him on the back and say, sir, this is the strongest cabinet we have ever had. Please give us another strong cabinet if you're reelected. I could not do my job. Simple statement, period, fact, if we did not have some strong leaders in these economic ministries. And so that is the key to replicating, is we need strong leaders. And there's still, unfortunately, some key ministries that don't have this leadership. I mentioned some of them when I described the clusters. I'm not going to tell you which ones they are. Um, but some of them clearly need to be under a super minister who does have a vision. Capacity building. Ay, ay, ay. Uh, that's a big one. Um, well, you're absolutely right that, well, what I just said, we have some very strong ministers. And then as you go down, my enthusiasm wanes. We have a few strong deputy ministers. We have some strong directors general. You know, and you just keep working your way down. Um, and obviously, that's something we need to pay a whole lot of attention to um, in the future. But as I said, it is hard to get people excited about taking on institution building. But let me give you a couple. Somebody was nice enough to say that 
I brought some solutions. And, and let me offer something very recent that we've done that I think, while it may put you to sleep, it's just extremely important. Can anybody in the room, um, we'll see how smart this crowd is. Um, can anybody in the room tell me what the five common functions are? It's a term of art. You can't ask a question. You should just know. Um, thank goodness we don't have more American advisors over there. Um, the five common functions are procurement, HR, financial management, project management, and policy development. The skills that every single civil service on this planet, I don't know about other planets, have to master. Now, I talked before about the problem at the very beginning in 2002 when Andrew Natsios was in charge. And everybody was doing, sorry, Andrew. And everybody was, because there wasn't anybody in the government to talk to, people started doing their own thing. And in this area, more than any other, you saw it. And you, what you would find if you traveled around the country or if you traveled to different ministries in the country, you would find that in this particular province, they were learning how to do procurement the Italian way. In this province, they were learning how to do procurement the German way. In this province, they kept their books and records the American way. In this province, they kept their books and records the, I don't know, pick a country, the Belgian way. Everybody was doing their own thing, and this is sustainable? So we recently, I mean, it's embarrassing to say this, but seven years later, we finally got everybody to agree, this is what I do, this is why I look like this. I got everybody, I got all the donors to agree for at least for the five common functions that every civil servant should have some knowledge of. Can we agree on an Afghan curriculum? And can we agree to all teach it? And everybody said yes. And so we launched that about a month ago. Kai and I went to the Civil Service Institute. We gave nice speeches. And that's underway now. And actually, USAID is paying for it. And all the donors were happy with that. So I mean, that's what we're fighting against in building the capacity of those other layers down. Because you know, if, if, if we talk about subnational governments, if we, if we talk about the capacity of the offices of the line ministries at the district level, they've got to have some of these skills. And they've got to have the Afghan skills, not the Italian, the Polish, the, the other ways. They've got to know the way their law deals with it, um, because that's what's sustainable. That's what they're going to. That's what the Civil Service Institute then can keep following up on and do in-service training and make sure that they stay up to speed. So anyway, that's just one example of the kinds of things um, that we have to do. The, one of your specific questions was, you know, will the donors put money into these kinds of programs? Um, let me say this. When, when you hear that UNAMA is getting behind an initiative, it's because the donors haven't been supporting it. We don't take on initiatives that we don't need to take on. Um, and we're taking on institution building big time, which should tell you that the donor's interest has very much been hot and cold. As I said before, it is not the most exciting subject in the world. How many of you knew what the five common functions are? None of you. How many of you can remember them? Probably very few of you. How many of you want to learn about procurement and HR and accounting? Um, Andrew made me run procurement once. I'll forgive him someday um, for that at USAID. Um, these are not exciting subjects. And capacity building at all levels of the Afghan government is not exciting. And this is why UNAMA feels like it's our job is to keep it front and center in front of everybody, in front of the donors, to keep them supporting it. Will we be successful? I hope so. As I said before, what I think we really need, I talked about the importance of a strong leader. We need a strong leader on this. We need a Hanif Atmar or a, you know, a, a Omar Zakhawal or somebody of that stature who can talk to you, who has a vision, who can really drive this. But so far, we don't have that in this particular area. Um, now, I will tell you that, and uh, let me jump ahead. There was the question about um, higher education and vocational training. 
Um, you're absolutely right. I think it was your question. You're absolutely right that this has been largely ignored by the donors. Um, I think I, I used to describe this as the acne syndrome. Donors lose interest in supporting education when the student gets acne. Teenagers are harder to support because we've all raised them. Um, it, it, and, and you just see this precipitous drop-off in support from all countries, not just the United States, when you start getting into post-secondary education and vocational training. Um, but, as I said, if UNAMA gets behind it, then it's, you can tell it's a problem. It's one of the clusters in the new strategy. It's because we cannot grow this economy without skilled labor in the country. We cannot do the training that's necessary for capacity building with net, without more university graduates. And, and the good news is that literally, I don't know, two weeks ago, the Ministry of Higher Education finally, better late than never, came up with a very good strategy to double the number of seats in the universities in Afghanistan. Double in five years. It's got a hefty price tag to go along with it, but it's actually a very disciplined plan. It focuses on building the capacity of Afghan professors um, in the region, sorry, but not sending them all to Georgetown, but more likely sending them to sort of make up for lost time to re universities in the region, in Pakistan, in India, in Iran, in Central Asia. Um, it focuses a lot on extra efforts to get women into the universities. It says no new campuses, which I think is a good idea. Let's improve the ones we've got before we start building more. Um, I think it's a great plan on the higher ed side. On the vocational ed side, a lot more needs to be done. But the private sector, not surprisingly, is beginning to respond. And what's encouraging is when you see the statistics on the number of Afghan families who are paying to send their kids, mostly their sons, to these private vocational education schools um, to learn some skills. So I think that's encouraging if we can somewhat regulate it and make sure that they're not teaching these kids 20-year-old technology. Um, but you're absolutely right, and that's why it's one of the clusters, is that we hope we can mobilize a whole lot more resources for that. And, and let me just put in a little plug here for Farouk Wardock. Um, I don't know if he's running for anything, but this is the Minister of Education. He's the one that alerted us to this problem, and it's completely against his interest. He's the Minister of Education. He worries about the kids up to class 12. He has done a great job, as did Hanif Atmar, in mobilizing resources from the donors. But he's the one who came to Yanama and said, we've created a, a nightmare. I'm going to be graduating all these kids, and there's nowhere for them to go. We have to come up with a plan. He put on a much bigger hat and said, we, the government and the international community, has to come up with a plan to solve this bigger problem because I'm producing too many educated kids. So that's the kind of leadership we need to take this forward. Um, democracy and, and, and development. You know, one of the great success stories in Afghanistan to date is the National Solidarity Program. And it, it rests on, and its success depends to a large extent on some very basic democratic principles. Namely, organize the community and ask them what they think is important, and then do it. Um, and I think uh, it is no surprise to me I mean, it has some good leadership. Minister Zia is a very capable um, uh, minister. Um, but it, it is successful because the, the community not only owns the initiative, it actually does own the initiative because it contributes to part of the cost. Um, it, it, you know, I hate to say it's democracy in action, but we do, the, the, it sets up a community development I think they're called committees, councils, I don't know what, uh, CDCs. There are thousands of them now. In fact, the project is so successful, the program is so successful that it, it, it's run short of funding. Um, and we're, we're, we're hopeful that one of these days we can convince ISAF to contribute some of their money, SERP money and SERP-like money from other countries to support the NSP. Because the NSP is doing the quick impact projects that the PRTs used to have the monopoly on and as I said before, that the, PR, that the PRTs have to stop doing and let the government start to do. Um, metrics. Um, for my particular effort, Chaz, I would say um, metrics is the, the how, to the extent that I can show that in a given sector, the funds are not being spent on 
projects outside of a government initiative and are being spent on projects um, aligned behind a government initiative. And it's very easy to measure. I mean, all of these um, government initiatives, uh, the ministers can keep track of what programs are supporting them, what programs are outside of them. Um, so that would be my metric um, because I, I'm just trying to eliminate the outliers uh, and get things behind the government's programs. Now, I will be the first to admit that in certain sectors I don't want to measure it because we don't have a strong leader yet. And without a strong minister or a strong leader in a sector, you're not going to get a strong plan. And then it's impossible for me to get the donors behind a weak plan. I'm just not going to do it. Sometimes I get in a little bit of trouble with the Ministry of Finance or with certain people in the Ministry of Finance who want me with my fancy title to get up and stand and speak out and harangue the donors on the principles of supporting government programs. I am not going to do that if it's a bad government program. And there are some bad government programs. And so I will be the world's biggest advocate for putting your money behind good programs. Um, but I think it's too important. We, we don't need any scandals in Afghanistan on the economic side. And so far, we have avoided them, um, except the extraordinary amounts of money that USAID pays to your organizations. Um, but that's, that's another topic for another day. Um, but uh, And please invite me back to harangue about that one. Um, but I, I'm, I think we can all be very proud of the fact that, we, as I said before in response to the question about corruption, we haven't had a scandal in the ministries working on the assistance program. So I am not going to stand up and say for, the, for principle's sake that we should be supporting every initiative coming out of the government. If they are good, absolutely. But if they are not, no. So for some metrics, for some sectors, I'm, I'm going to skip metrics for now. Um, I think it's in those in certain sectors it's probably just as well that the donors are still doing their own thing because I don't have anything to align them behind yet. But in other sectors that would be my measure of success, being able to say that you know what was 70 percent of the budget for agriculture being spent on um, what the donors thought were the what the donors initiatives shifting to 70 percent of the budget being spent on initiatives designed by Minister Rahimi. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for that. Now, based on the response ratio time to the question time, I think we only have time for one or two more questions. <laughs> uh, let's take Andrew, please. Okay, that was a, more of a comment than a question. Oh. Okay, one more question, and then um, anybody else oh, in the back? Yes, one of my colleagues from CSIS. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on... Uh, Can you introduce aid? yourself? Oh, I'm Jane Kaminsky from CSIS. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the infrastructural development or the aid going towards transportation infrastructure. Okay, great. Andrew, I, the last I heard, which was from WFP, was that things were looking more hopeful and in particular with relation to the United States. Um, but I don't have any more detail than that. Um, I can tell you that, you know, Asif Rahimi is a great leader in the Ministry of Agriculture, and this is something he talks about all the time. Um, he gets, uh, how shall I put it, pretty perturbed when in response to some emergency need in the country, the default is to look outside of Afghanistan to, to meet the requirement. Um, he very much wants the opportunity to meet that requirement. He recognizes the risks that he might fail occasionally, but he, he's, he, he wants the challenge. And this is, one, again, just an, one more small reason why this, this, this man is kind of inspiring. Um, he's willing to take risks to, to succeed from time to time. Um, transportation infrastructure, this is very interesting. You know, when, when the United States, when everybody returned to Afghanistan in 2002, um, our signature project at, at the very beginning, or almost the very beginning, was the Kabul to Kandahar Road. And then that continued around, um, and the United States did, if you can picture a map in your head, if you can picture a ring road around the country connecting Mazar Sharif, Kabul, Kandahar, and Herat, um, the United States then also agreed to, to take care of a third of the distance from Kandahar to Herat, and did. Um, Saudi Arabia eventually did its third, 
believe it or not, and Andrew, I think you'll enjoy this because uh, we used to follow this so closely. Um, just uh, at the June JCMB, Japan announced it had finished its third in, in 2000, whatever year this is, 2009. Now, of course, we all celebrated and patted Japan on the back, and it is truly an accomplishment given how security has deteriorated in Kandahar because they had the chunk from Kandahar City west, so arguably a pretty tough piece to take on. But, but I think the reason I brought that up is it illustrates how much harder it has become to do transportation infrastructure in the south and the east. Going back to the government's new plan, the focus is on trying to get investments in infrastructure in the north and the center, where, relatively speaking, you don't have the same security concerns. You are not going to have to spend near as much on security per kilometer of road or railroad or whatever it is you're building in those parts of the country as you are in the south. Um, there are still very important infrastructure needs in the south and the east. And one of the other things we're trying to push the PRTs to do so that they stop doing little quick impact projects and start doing things that are really important that need to be done are to look at infrastructure needs because the PRTs sort of by definition have security. So they can take on some of these roads and other infrastructure needs that perhaps the civilian agencies can't yet in the south and in the east. And these are big ticket items and given how SERP has gone up, um, handy because they need a lot of money. Um, SERP can now pay for projects that it couldn't pay for before just because SERP has grown so much. So one of the things we're pushing is, you know, use it more effectively to do the big ticket items that the government, the NSP and other programs can't do. Okay, great. Well, I promised Mark I'd keep this um, to, uh, uh, to time, so I think we're going to have to close there. But I really want to thank him again for a really extraordinary um, and open discussion today. And thank also – thanks. No journalists here, right? <laughs> thanks also to all the CSIS volunteers who helped out. So let's just give him a